I brought these pillows because of the message today is titled uh, Three Pillows. The reason I titled it is Three Pillows is because uh, we're going to talk about three comforts that we, uh, that we have in the faith that God's Word uh, gives us in Romans chapter 8, at least uh, from verses 18 to 39. These are my pillows. I have more pillows, obviously. I don't use uh, just small pillows. But pillows are, are very beneficial to us. They help us sleep better, or at least they should. Um, I was researching on pillows, and um, they didn't start off so soft at first. They started off as basically decorated rocks. And only the, the wealthy in the, in the East had them, like China and different uh, Asiatic uh, continents. And then they slowly moved to the, to the West, to Europe. And then by that time, the only ones that used pillows were women uh, in labor and then uh, weak, uh, and the weak and the elderly. So finally, fast forward to today, you know, everybody's using pillows, and they are a great uh, benefit. Let me put these away over here. That's it for them. But those are my pillows. I don't share my pillows unless I'm sharing my bed, and that would be my wife. Um, we have our own pillows at home. But the pillows we're going to talk about today, we share them. If you're a believer here this morning, you share that pillow, you share that comfort, you share that promise with other believers, and that's a, that's a great thing. We, we're picking up here in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. If you're not there, go ahead and uh, start flipping pages or turning on your apps here. Romans 8, verse 18. Uh, Romans, um, Romans chapter 7, Paul uses uh, the personal pronoun I 32 times, and the word spirit is only mentioned about one time. But Romans chapter 8 is sort of the opposite of Romans chapter 7 in the sense that the personal pronoun I is only used twice and the word spirit is now used about 21 times. So there's quite a contrast. In Romans chapter 7, we see, uh, we see a picture of Paul's humanity. Paul says, hey, you know, I want to do the right thing, but sometimes I end up doing the opposite thing. I end up practicing what I shouldn't. And we see a little a, a glimpse of Paul's humanity, a glimpse of Paul, uh, the not-so-perfect Paul, the chief of all sinners, as he refers to himself else, elsewhere. But here in Romans chapter 8, I mean, Romans chapter 8, if you were here when I began this, uh, this chapter, it starts off with the promise. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 there, a comforting pillow at least. You know, the, it starts off by saying, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And it ends with the promise. Just look at the last verse. The first promise is, there's no condemnation. The last verse is there's no separation, at least from God's love, the love that God has for us. And I, I just want to tell you this, and all through the middle of this passage, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. These chapters, these, this chapter at least, and the verses we're going to read are very promising, very comforting, things that, that, that you can sleep better at night knowing, knowing that God is taking care of things in the background. I divided this passage into three parts. I usually have an outline here, and you can look at the, the simple outline in your bulletins if you have one. Uh, but it's three basic things I want you to write down, three basic uh, pillows of the faith I would like for you to take home uh, this morning. But we can't take comfort in, the, in these things just by hearing them. We have to know them. We have to apply them to our lives, as, is, as with every other scripture that we read. Again, the Bible tells us faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer and begin this uh, message. Father, I thank you again, Lord, for each and every person here, Lord. Uh, again, Lord, we want to lift up Joseph and Rebecca, Lord. We pray that you would just uh, work all things out there, Lord, that, that they would not be uh, too nervous, Lord, that you would just uh, bless their their day-to-day, -day, Lord, that all would go well, Father God. And we ask for us, Lord, we ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit as we, as we uh, flip through the pages of your of your word, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would challenge us, Lord, that you would uh, cause us to be uh, closer uh, to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're picking up here in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. We'll be finishing up the chapter this morning. So the first pillow I have here is, something better is in store for me. Notice I use some personal pronouns here because this is, this is a, a personal promise for you. Okay? So I want you to take it as that, as something personal, something the Lord has for you, if you are a believer this morning. Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be 
revealed in us. Revealed in us. But Paul starts off saying, or who he starts off speaking to are uh, persecuted Christians. Per Christians that were going through a lot of suffering. You know, the first uh, 10 uh, Roman emperors were very cruel to Christianity. About 5 to 6 million Christians were martyred during that time, the 10 uh, periods. I think uh, the last emperor was named Diocletian. Right after him was Constantine. That's when, well, basically the church married the, the Roman state there. And we thought, well, things are going to get better now. But no, things went. There was a slippery slope there as well. Uh, there was a lot of persecution. Paul is speaking here to Christians that are suffering for their faith. I understand here in the States it's harder for us to sort of uh, relate to them. But we should. We should relate to them. We should understand that, hey, if you're born again in Christ, you're going. There is still something better. No matter if you live, you know, you got the white picket fence. Your house is perfect. You got the... You know, all your kids are saved. You got the, you know, a beautiful wife or husband and so on. You think everything is perfect here, even for you. Heaven, this place here is not, of no comparison to what is in heaven. The worst suffering here on earth cannot even compare to the, to the less significant things in heaven. But Paul here specifically is referring to, to our glorification, to our glorified bodies. And he's doing, he's doing a contrast here between what is here, the sufferings here, and the glories of the new body, at least in heaven as well, I would, I would assume is implied. Look at what he also says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4.17. Again, speaking of the same things. He says, for our light affliction, notice the three contrasts. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The word of weight here can also be translated heaviness. So notice, compare the heaviness to the lightness. Here on earth, any suffering is light work. It's light compared to the glories in heaven. They cannot even be compared. So he compares these things. He compares the momentary sufferings to the eternal glories that we will have in heaven. And I know to them, to them, to the, to the first readers of, of this letter, to them it meant, possibly meant more than what it means to us. Unless you hear our suffering with a debilitating disease, or know someone that is, maybe to them this passage means a lot more to them. It's more alive. But we can use these scriptures to encourage each other during these tough times. Paul tells us elsewhere that we are to carry each other's burdens. So again, Paul contrasts these things. He starts off in verse 18 by contra contrasting the sufferings here, present time, with what is to come. Verse 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The word here for eagerly waits can also be translated persistent expectation. Literally, the word picture here is long necking, basically stretching your neck out as far as possible, looking forward to something you're waiting for. Just, for example, just waiting in line for the next iPhone, the newest iPhone or whatever. You're waiting to see if the line is moving along. You're stretching out your neck because you're in expectancy of what is ahead. Again, this is the word picture he's trying to give us here, but he's not referring to us. He's referring to the creation here. He's referring not just to, to, uh, to the animals, but to, to the animal kingdom, but to, to earth itself. He's personifying earth here because think about it. When the fall happened, the earth was cursed. There was no death before the fall. There was no thorns before the fall. So again, he's personifying creation here, and he's saying creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. I like how the J.B. Phillips translation puts it. The whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming into their own. Sort of looking forward to that consummation of our salvation. Because I've said it many times before, but I'll say it again if you haven't heard it. We, we can rightfully say we have been saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. We have been saved because we've been justified. We are being saved because we are being sanctified and we will be saved because one day we will be glorified. We'll be out of this shell. We'll get our glorified bodies. And that's what, what our creation is looking forward to because there's a benefit to creation. There's a benefit to the animal kingdom as well because there will be no more death. Notice, I also wanna, want you to take note. If you're taking notes, there are three groanings you're going to see by three different uh, uh, things, three different um, people. Verse 20 says, again, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it 
and hope. And again, God has his hands in here, right? God is the one that basically uttered the, the statement, the, crowd, the ground shall be cursed. God is sovereign still in all these things, yet he is righteous and just. But God is, God is going to work these things out eventually for mankind. Verse 21 says, Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation, notice, groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. What are these groanings that we see on the earth? And we can just turn on the TV and see the groanings. 7.7 .7 earthquake, uh, flooding, tsunamis, tornadoes, all these things, they were not so in the beginning. These things gradually happen because of the fallen uh, nature, because we live in a fallen world. Not only that, but, you know, dog eat dog cycle, bigger animal eats smaller animal. But in the future, during the millennial kingdom, the lion will be resting, sitting next to the lamb. They, it, it'll be different. It'll, it'll be quite the opposite. In Isaiah 55, there, there's a passage that sort of talks about this a bit. Isaiah 55, 12, 13. It says, You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Where once there was thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. They will be an everlasting sign of His power and love. So again, this is a feature thing that the, even earth is personified as looking forward to. When the culmination of things happen. Right here in verse 19. I can tell you, and I think you, most of you, uh, at least most of you would agree with me, that there is sort of an agenda uh, of sort of a Al Gore-ism type of agenda, go green type of agenda, save the planet type of agenda, where that is sort of being pushed on today by environmentalists, even on, uh, on TV as well in movies. Just the other day, I think two days ago, we went to watch a movie. Um, and uh, I won't tell you the name of the movie. I don't want to spoil it for you if you watch it. <clears throat> but in the movie, basically, the, the movie was consistent upon saving the planet, gathering the, uh, the intellectuals uh, uh, of the world to save the earth. And if you don't save it, well, you know, there's a problem with you. It's the, the, the saving of the earth is dependent upon you. But the scriptures teach us quite the contrary. Things are going to get worse before they get better. I also uh, read an article where the, uh, the president was talking about, uh, I think he was talking to uh, the, the serviceman, I'm not sure if it was the Navy, whoever he was talking to, he was speaking to, uh, he, was, he was giving a speech and he was saying that the reason that Boko Haram and all these Middle Eastern uh, Muslim terrorists are the way they are is because of climate change, because of global warming, because of drought and all that. And, and we see that agenda, we see that agenda even being pushed through there. But the scripture says quite the contrary. You know, we shouldn't be hugging trees. We should be hugging the cross. That's what we should be hugging. We should be embracing that because it is linked. It is linked to what the creation groans for. Our first point is, if you want to save the world, save yourself. And not that you, you can save yourself, of course not, but by trusting Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, he saves you. Acts 2.4, he says, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those were one of the first words Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. After all, the fall did happen with the tree, right? Adam ate from forbidden, the forbidden fruit. In verse 23, it says, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan. That's the second groan we, I, I've got down so far. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting. So the earth is not the only one eagerly waiting for something. We are eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Again, the glorification. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Notice here back in... Um, verse 23, where it talks about the first fruits of the Spirit here. What he's trying to say is, uh, the, the gifts of the Spirit, even, even um, the fruits of the Spirit, these things are first fruits of, of what, just a taste, a foretaste of what is to come. 
For example, if you're a farmer, uh, the first fruits of, of, of the crops point to a greater harvest in the future. It's just a foretaste of what is to come, and I think that's what, what Paul is trying to say here, here in verse 23. We also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption. We're, we're, we should be looking forward to these things. And I know in life we can get comfortable. We can have a, a lax attitude. And that's okay if you, don't, if you make sure not to forget the kingdom things. If you make sure not to forget that, hey, there, there's, there's something out there that is better than this. We're only here temporarily. And it's okay to, to look forward to the latest gadget, all right? You know, get your gadget and go. Look forward to, to, to a wedding, all right? Joseph and Rebecca are getting married uh, tonight. They're looking forward to that. That's great. Looking forward to the delivery of a child. Those things are all good, but we should not forget to look forward to, to the consummation of things, to look forward to what Jesus is going to give us. He's not done with us yet. He's still working in us. And I think we should look forward in that same way, with outstretched necks, spiritually at least. See, when we got saved, when we got saved, we didn't get raptured up right away. We're still in this body. So when we got saved, it's like we got a built-in new software, okay? But we're still in the 1976 Apple computer that you can't really turn. It's thick. It's like 40 pounds heavy. It's got the black screen and the green letters, floppy disk and all that. We're, we don't have a change of hardware yet but the software is there. We've been regenerated. We've been born again of the Spirit. But the glorification, that's when you get your new hardware. That's when the Lord is going to change things up externally. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. He's referring to death here. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Okay? And that, that's what we're looking for. That's what I'm trying to instill in you to look forward to with an outstretched neck. There's, there, there's a brother here. He comes to first service. And uh, he's ha he broke his neck a while back. He has uh, metal plates in his neck. And he's got some screws keeping his neck in place. And he's a sweet guy. You know, I talk to him all the time. And, but when you, when you talk to him... Uh, He's got to turn his whole body to face you because he can't really turn his neck. Not any more than maybe half an inch either way. But I bet you he's looking more forward than us with an outstretched neck, at least spiritually outstretched neck, for that coming day when he's going to get a whole new body, right? When he's going to get a whole new hardware. And I think this is what Paul was telling the Christians there. Hey, you know, man can only destroy the body. Man can only destroy the body and no more. That's what we should be looking for, no matter how good we might have it here or not. The second thing here is in, is in reference to prayer. It's in uh, verses 26 to 27. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we, for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with what? Groanings, right? That's the third groaning. Even the Spirit now is groaning. Which cannot be uttered, it says. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So again, verse 26 here, the Spirit helps us with our weaknesses. How many, who's a perfect prayer warrior here? I'm glad nobody raised their hands because I'm not. I certainly am not. You know, I need help in prayer. Sometimes there's a lot of quiet time during our prayers because we don't know what to pray about. And it's good to wait on the Lord. But I'm glad that, you know, that's why the Holy Spirit is referred to as the helper. Jesus says, I go, but if I don't go, the helper won't be able to come. Helper has come, so he doesn't just help us with the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit, but he also helps us in prayer, in our prayer life. And that's a, that helps me sleep better at night because that tells me, hey, even though I didn't get to pray for everything I needed to pray or I didn't pray right, the Holy Spirit is doing something in the background that I know briefly, just minutely about from what the Scriptures Tell me here, because a lot of times, even, let's say you pray a lot, okay? Let's say you pray a lot, but let's say in your prayers, they're always directing God. You're instructing God on how you want him to, uh, to answer your prayers. Like, Lord, this is what I want, and this is how, step one, step two, and three, this is how I'm going to get it. But the Lord wants to do the opposite in you. The Lord wants, sometimes the Lord wants us to do a little bit less talking and a little bit more listening. He wants to instruct us 
right? Because it's been said several times. You know, a prayer accommodates us or prayer aligns us to God's will. And I think this is what Paul is implying here. The Holy Spirit sort of helps with that. Now, this is not an excuse to say, well, I'm not going to pray. The Holy Spirit is hounding in the background. I don't think that's what Paul, you know, if that was an issue, I think Paul would have addressed it. He's speaking to people that pray. He helps us with prayer. And I love that because he sees into the heart in verse 27. He searches the heart. The Holy Spirit knows you more than you know yourself. Not only that, the Holy Spirit is God. So he knows God's will, obviously. So he, he does the aligning there as far as the prayer groanings go. Somebody once said, and this is, I don't want to be dogmatic about this, but somebody once said, well, you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus or through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that makes sense. You know, we see the Trinity even in prayer. But there are also passages that, that have prayers towards Jesus as well. That's just one way of, uh, of looking at it. But I, have, I find comfort in that. When I, you know, let's say I, I, I mess up in prayer or I didn't pray enough, you know, the Holy Spirit is there with these groanings that cannot be uttered. Now, verse 28 to 39, the last uh, passage here, I titled, uh, Someone's Looking Out for Me. And that is God, obviously. He's looking out for us. Now, this is more in reference of the things working in the background. This passage in verse 28 is a very commonly um, quoted passage, but also a very commonly uh, misunderstood passage. It must be taken together with verse 29. But let's look at verse 28 first. Paul says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, there are several things we, we have to understand. First, it doesn't say some things, right? It says all things, good and bad, I would assume. Good and bad things work together for our good. So, and, and that's not everybody's good, but those you know, that are called by God and love God and so on. It's implying believers here. But it doesn't say some things. It says all things, right? So that guy at work that annoys you or that girl at work that annoys you, that you, you know you want to punch the lights out of them sometimes, that God is working that for something good, okay? The, uh, maybe you got marriage problems. Well, God, you know, it's been said that marriage is a great sanctifying work, even children. It's hard sometimes. Babies don't let you sleep at night. Well, you know, God is going to work that out for your good. Maybe you need some discipline. Again, all these things are worked out for good. Even if to us, well, this is a bad thing, this is a good thing, bad or good, God is going to work it out for the believer for his ultimate good. And we'll talk about what that specifically that good is. I was reading a story about this African king who loved to hunt. He had this friend that he, uh, that he always said, uh, it is good. Whatever happened, whether it was bad or good, whether he hit his... Uh, uh, Finger with the hammer, he always said, it is good. Everything, whatever it was, it is good. Runs over the cat with the, with the truck, it is good. Well, one time, this guy, was the friend, was in charge of, um, of uh, fixing the, the, the king's guns, preparing the guns so he can go out and hunt. Well, on one of those hunting trips, the, 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 the king gets out his, his, his weapon there. He shoots it. Somehow, it, it shoots back, and it blows off his thumb. And he goes up to his friend, and he's like, what's going on? You know, you didn't fix the gun, and this and that. And, and the friend says, what does he say? It is good. The king's mad, he's furious, he's like, no, this is definitely not good, and he has him thrown in jail for about a year. So fast forward sometime later, the king is hunting again. This time he's hunting a little bit in, in different lands. Well, he gets caught up by, uh, by cannibals. Cannibals take him, tie him up, get the fire pit going. Then they know, they're, right before they're about to feast, they, they notice that he's missing a thumb. So these guys are kind of, these cannibals are kind of superstitious, and they're like, well, we can't eat a man unless he's whole. So they let him go. They let the guy go. They let him go. And as the king is walking back home, he starts feeling remorseful for his friend. He's like, wow, I'm glad that my thumb was gone, or else I would have been cannibal chow. And uh, fast forward, he's talking to his friend. He's like, look, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to bail you out. I'm sorry that, that I put you in jail. And the friend is like, no, it is good. He's like, no, no, it is not good that I put you in jail for a year. He's like, no, it is good because um, if you were to put me in jail, I would have been with you and I would have been eaten, but not you. <laughs> <laughs> that went better second service, actually. <laughs> That's Tim over there. But ultimately, all things do work out 
for good for for the for the believer, and and we're gonna see what 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 that good is. And I think for the unbeliever as well, bad things happen to everybody under the sun. Everybody under the sun, bad things happen. But unless the bad things that happen to unbeliever lead, uh, you know, if they lead them to Christ, that's a good thing. Okay, a lot of people come to Christ because you know they hit rock bottom. The gospel is given to them. They accept it. Their lives are changed, and they grow from then on. But for the most part, things are growing, working out for good for the believer. The other a couple weeks ago, we had a flood here in the in the youth uh, bathroom. I know not a lot of you know about this. I sort of kind of wanted to forget about it. You know, that's around the time when uh, when we started building this stage. I was like, Joseph, just go forward. Let's not look backward. Let's let's build a stage and you know let's paint the, the other area and all that. And uh, but there was a flood there. Uh, uh, water heater broke and the water went through all the walls and went to this suite and over here this was all wet and uh the, the way we found it was the, the the youth leader he he came back that it happened on a sunday he came back on the sunday he had forgot a paper and i'm glad he did but again you know god was working that in the background he came and he saw the water by that time everything was mostly wet the water was off though or else we wouldn't have seen it till like monday in the afternoon and everything would have been wet here where you guys are at as well and um anyways i got a rude awakening i was asleep on my pillows and uh, the, 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 the church is, is wet, and, and I'm like, oh, and so I come over here, and, and it was problematic. The insurance didn't want to pay it. They said, well, you're only covered with the stuff that you own, like this right here. You don't really own the building, so you're not covered with it. The landlord is like, well, it's, the lease says it's as is, so you got to deal with it. So I was stressing. I was like, Lord, how are we going to do this? This is going to be thousands and thousands of dollars. But again, the Lord is always working out in the background. Eventually... You know, it got paid. It, it got, you know, it got worked out with the with the insurance. They took care of it. But it's those times where you gotta trust in the Lord. You gotta wait upon Him, and so on. A lot of people, I'll give you, I'll give a lot of people the benefit of the doubt. They're good at fixing bad things. Okay. I know some guys are pretty good as you know. I got a problem here. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm gonna go around this problem and I'm gonna fix it. You can be real handy, but you can't do that all the time. God needs somebody need, else needs to be watching, you know, watching out for you. I can sleep better knowing that God is working things out for me in the background. Look at what the psalmist says here, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Okay? I can sleep better knowing that God is working things. After all I've done, after all the sweat and toil, God is in control. But again, Romans does not end in Romans verse, chapter 8, verse 28. There's another verse that follows it. And this is what it says, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, and we've got some doctrinal terms here. For whom he foreknew, that is to know beforehand, he also predestined, that is to foreordain, to foreordain beforehand, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And the word firstborn here means unique. Jesus, the, being the firstborn from the resurrection, doesn't mean that he's the firstborn that resurrected, obviously. But it means that he's the unique one, supreme one, that resurrected again. Because see, Lazarus, he resurrected, but he had to die back again. Martha and Mary had to mourn again, if indeed he died before them for the second time. But Jesus rose again to never die again. He rose again in his glorified body. He was going through doors. He no longer had to knock. The grave, the, the tomb was not... Uh, the stone on the tomb was not removed for him. He can go through it. It was removed for us so we can look into it and see that he is not there. He is alive. So again, that is how Jesus is the firstborn, and he's gone before us, and he's pointing to what, what will be for us as well. But he does use these words here as well, for no, to know before him, predestination. That is what God is trying to work out in us, to make you a little bit more like Jesus. That is what we call sanctification. He, he, he's, uh, some say even he's preparing us for heaven somehow but whether that is you know a little bit of, a little bit of truth or a lot true what i know is that god is in control god is sovereign he, he's, he's making me more like jesus i can tell you i'm a little bit more like jesus now than when i barely got saved because when i barely got saved i still wanted to party a little bit i still wanted to you know be the good dad and still go get high with the friends and still drink my 40 you know and come be a good dad and a good father and a good husband but the lord changes that he sanctifies you he he changes your vocabulary. So that's what God is trying to work in the background. Ephesians 1 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, 
that we should be holy, that is set apart, and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Okay? God is sovereign. And yes, we have free volition. We have free will. And they don't contradict. Okay? Our free will does not contradict with God's choosing and God's sovereignty. Someone put it like this, and this is not going to explain, this is not going to solve the whole debate. But someone put it like this one time. It's like playing chess. You got the master chess player here, and then you got me. I don't know how to, I really don't know how to play chess. Checkers? Yeah. But chess, I don't. And um, so I'm playing the master chess player. Do you think I'm going to have a chance to win ever? I don't think so. Unless the guy fall, drops down dead, I'm not going to win. Well, he's always going to be, beat me. He's always going to be several steps ahead of me all the time. And that's how it is with God. God is sovereign. God knows all things. His ways are higher than our ways. So I can make a move by my free will, but God is always going to have another move there, several steps ahead of me beforehand. And I think that's sort of somehow how God's sovereignty works. That does not explain the whole thing. But God's word simply says, hey, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You want to find out if you're a chosen one? If you're not saved yet, well, accept the Lord. Find out. You know, the offer is given to, the calling is offered to everyone. See, Jesus died for the, the whole world. That's unbelievers included. So whether we're going through a rough patch or, or um, you know, or, or everything seems to be working out right now, you know, we still need Jesus. We still need the Lord working things out in the background. Verse 30 says, Moreover, again, some more. If you, if you thought those two words were a little bit hard, you got some more coming for you in verse 30. Moreover, then, moreover whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. And what I like about this is this is comforting to me because God is from outside of time speaking to us from the, uh, his side of the fence of eternity. He's from outside of time. And he's telling me, he's looking at my salvation as a done deal, as something done did, because he says, hey, they've been glorified as well already. And that, I find that comforting because that tells me, hey, Good work that God started in me and in you, he's, he's, he's going to finish it. I can't, I mean, you might say, well, I'll, I'll send myself out of God's grace. Now, you can have that view. That's fine. But I see this. I find, that I find a comforting thing here. I find a comforting pillow in knowing that God is in control. He's in control of my, my salvation as well. Verse 31 says, what then shall we say to these things? The hypothetical question is here. What can we say about this? Notice this, another commonly quoted verse. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's powerful. Now, I'm going to finish reading the chapter here, and then we'll discuss it real quick here. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's leg? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So three things we see about Christ already. Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, and Christ ascended for us, and he's interceding. Actually, four things. He's interceding for us now. So who can really cause an accusation against us? Maybe the devil. Yeah, for sure, the devil does that. That's his ministry, to accuse the brethren. Our consciences can accuse us. Other people can accuse us. But do they have, can they legally accuse us? Did they justify us? No, the Lord justifies us. He's in control. Even while we were yet his enemies, he died for us. So this is what he says here in verse uh, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember I told you this, this chapter begins with the promise of, of uh, no condemnation and ends with the promise of no separation. I take comfort in that. I can rest in that. Now some might say, well, you don't want to give people... You don't want to give people a chance to take advantage of God's grace. You don't want to tell them too much about this. You know, tone it down a bit. But again, this is, I don't feel like sinning more now because I know God has me in his hands or because God loves me so much. No, that encourages me to look forward, to be more confident. You know what I like about verse, 17, uh, verse 37 here? 
where I hear where it says the five words, we are more than conquerors. That's actually one word in the Greek. It's pronounced uh, hooper nikau. The, the latter part of that nikau is the Greek word for Nike or how, where we get our English word for Nike. You know, and, 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 and right there, it's referring to conquerors. But a conqueror, a conqueror is somebody that goes out and conquers, right? He toils, he sweats, he fights, and he conquers. That's a conqueror. But more than a conqueror, I would say somebody that goes out and the battle is already won because the Lord has already gone before us. So it's not by our works, it's by the work of the Lord. I would say the finished work of the Lord on the cross. We are more than conquerors. I can sleep with that. I can rest with that. Where Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know what happens to the day of Jesus Christ? Well, I think uh, we get glorified. We get our glorified bodies. And I trust, as Paul tells us, he's going to complete the work he's began in us. I take comfort in that, that nothing can separate us from God's immense love. Last verse here, 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Okay? So if you don't believe it, even though it's true, if you don't believe it, or you look at it in a superficial way, it doesn't affect your, the way you live, well, you're not going to benefit from it. It's like you being a prisoner, the gate has been open for you, but you're still stuck in a corner, but, he, but you're free. You've been free for a while. And that's what I think the Lord wants us, you know, God wants us to live in victory and, and, and walk by faith and not by sight, but we've got to crawl out of that open door. The door has been opened. Jesus is risen again. He has died for, for our sins, and we believe in that, but we must walk by faith not by sight, and the Lord tells us, hey, you're an overcomer. You're more than an overcomer. That, that helps me to walk in confidence because I can, you know, we can do this. We, we, let's, you know, we can rally up people. We can go street witnessing. We can do this and that and so on. But those are my efforts. If the Lord is not for it, what, what's going to happen, right? God is the one that asks to the church those who would be getting saved. So I trust in that, that even after all my work, after all your work, God is still in control, and he's still working things out in the background. I take that comfort. And I think, the, you know, the only way to take advantage of, the, of these things, again, is by faith, faith to rest in these things. So back again, recap. These three things take home. Something better is in store for me. You're not going to stay with that body uh, that you have now. God's going to give you a better body. He's going to glorify you. And that and more. Number two, someone is praying for me. The Holy Spirit Holy Spirit helps you in, in, in your prayer life. Though you do not hear these utterances, He's there, and we must believe in that as well. Number three, someone's looking out for me. That is God. All these things, bad or good, He's working them out in the background, and He's making us more like, like His Son. What I want to do right now before uh, Tim comes up is I want you guys to bow your heads and pray with me real quick. And if you're here this morning and you do not, you know for a fact, that you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ and the Lord has been calling you this morning, the Holy Spirit has been drawing you, hey, do you want to accept Jesus? Raise your hand. Don't put it off any longer. If that's you this morning, raise your hand now. Father, I thank you again, Lord, for each and every person here, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that your word will become alive to us, Lord. I know we're not suffering through the same persecution as our brothers and sisters in, uh, in Iraq in Ramadi, Lord, and um, in all these other countries, Lord, that are suffering heavily under the hand of persecution, Lord. But we want to pray for them, Lord. We want to continue uh, to pray for them, Lord. For Pastor Saeed as well, Lord. We want uh, to be more like you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.